Hey everyone, my name is Sam. Thanks for checking out this video. If you get to the end and liked it, then subscribe, bell notification, and give the video a thumbs up. Um, before we even get started on this, congratulations America. You're hopefully kind of, sort of, maybe back to being like, not hella run by a fascist. Um, I know things are a bit chaotic in your country, but uh, we've all literally not been doing anything, at least in Canada. <laughs> We share a border with y'all. It's been really uncomfortable for the past four years. I'm, I'm sure it happened gradually, but I remember like I've for university course and everything, I had to listen to like speeches from like Mussolini and Stalin and Trump has a lot of those mannerisms and he uses a lot of the tactics in that. So that was then just switching so quickly back to, while well, Trump was having a tantrum on Twitter to someone speaking normally and using terms like we and us as a country. And like, y'all may not, half of you may not like him, but like, he's still like trying to think of country as a whole rather than Trump, like literally spending four years being like, oh, those leftists, oh, those left, it is wild. So I can imagine what it feels like being in that actual country right now. So congratulations. Anyways, um, let's talk about October wrap up. I know it's a little bit late. Um, last week I just was, it was bit, last week it was just, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And I realized like Sunday night that I hadn't filmed anything for Tuesday. My bad, totally. Uh, so October wrap up. I read a fair amount. I'm pretty happy with everything that I read and we will do again, I think kind of a speed round, quick couple sentences reviews while I go over what I read and then my favorites, most favorites and yeah. Starting off, I read The Haunting by J.A. White. This is the sequel to Ar Archimancy. I think that's the first one. It's the Shadow School series by J.A. White. Um, I really enjoyed the first one, and I think this one was just as fun. It continues on in the same world where the kids are trying to catch, catch the ghosts, and then there's this whole thing coming back of the creator of the school's legacy and, and everything behind that, and these weird people that may also be trying to catch the ghosts and some ghosts who don't want to disappear. So I think it's just a really fun play on a lot of um, like school magic things that we talk about, but I just messing with a little bit with like with architectural and stuff. I would have never even thought of that stuff. So I loved it. I like the characters. It's a great continuation from the first book and I have no idea how long, how much longer the series is going to be, but I will read the next one. So five out of five stars. Then I read Silver in the Wood and the sequel Drowning County, which are novellas. I can't remember the author's name for the life of me. I'm so sorry. It was from the library. Um, these were very weird, but wonderful books. Uh, very whimsical, magical, but very quick quick reads. Um, I felt a little bit like I was put in, in the middle of something of what was happening, but um, not in a way that I felt totally completely lost in a way that I was like, oh, I want to find out exactly what is happening. Um, so definitely would recommend this series. You can read both of them in a couple hours. Um, yeah, highly enjoyed. Five out of five stars for both of them. Then I read Empire of the Wild by Sherry D. Maline. Um, I'm really happy I did. I liked this book. It's very weird. Very weird, but I really liked this book for sure. I think it's one that would appeal a bit more to general audiences. I know that's something that um, we have heard a bit with publishers is struggling to find um, Indigenous authors to publish in the mainstream that have the um, marketability and the financial value because in the end it is a business. Um, and a lot of authors, Indigenous authors, will write like nonfiction residential school stories or poetry. That's where there is a lot of content. But just regular fiction is, isn't is quite as um, widely findable. But Sherry de Moline is an author I think that does make her stuff a little bit more accessible to the mainstream. And I think this is kind of a perfect example. It was really, really weird and cool. And I really liked it. I also picked up The Wither Wizards of Earthsea by uh, Ursula Le Guin, I think the author's name is. Um, I had never read this author before, but then I started getting floated around when JK Rowling had another transphobia flare up um, of, of an option for people to read um, uh, instead of Rowling. And I enjoyed it. I don't know that it, I think it has a lot of the same characteristics that I, I love from Harry Potter and Nevermore and everything like that. I think it's an enjoyable fantasy, but I don't think I loved it as much as I like something like Nevermore or Harry Potter. Um, but it's fun. It's whimsical. It's not a quick read, though. It's a thicker book for sure. Um, but I enjoyed it for sure. Then I picked up and read Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, she's a Canadian Mexican author. And this hit New York Times bestsellers list is the first of her books, I think, to do that. It was really, really good. I really like it. I'm not generally a fan of horror or gothic -y stuff, but I really did enjoy this. Um, I can't speak for someone who's a big, like, big consumer and a little bit, um, nitpicky about horror but this one I feel it was just weird um 
again in like kind of kind of an endearing way I loved the main character especially the setting was really really cool everything just felt wonky and off in this book um and I, like you were the main character and you're walking around and you can feel that something's wrong um and the main character is looking to try and find out what exactly happened to her cousin who married this dude and maybe he wasn't for the money he's trying to kill her and like there's just this just everything's off everything's wonky you felt kind of uncomfortable but I was so like what is it, what exactly is happening I need to know the answer to this one I think it's just another great uh, work by the author and I know she has an older book getting re-released in 2021 I think it is it's a vampire book um so I'm excited to pick that one up as well for sure and just continue following her I think this isn't necessarily a genre that I would have picked up otherwise but because of the author I got into it and I enjoyed it so it's another one's four out of five stars then I did a read of reread of Serpent and Dove by Shelby Mahurin and then I read the new book the sequel Blood and Honey I definitely like Serpent and Dove more than Blood and Honey um and but not to the same extent I know I saw some people who were like Blood and Honey is not a good book like it's just not good who really loved the first book and then I saw some people who were like oh my god it's amazing it's the best book ever um I don't agree with that either I think but in a rare twist though I don't normally understand why I like one book better than another a lot of the times it takes me a lot of like self-reflection and figuring things out but I am so like a blunt like bluntly aware of why I liked Serpent Dove more than Blood and Honey I don't think Blood and Honey is a bad book by any means um we get to see a whole lot more of the world and a lot more of the characters and political conflict than we saw in the first one which is great but my like biggest like Achilles heel when I love a book like if I will auto buy it I will just auto start following that author when there is banter that is my week I love it I love it so much that's why I love Sebastian de Castell stuff that's why I loved you deserve each other books with just non-stop banter um a I think it's difficult to write um but also of like it can make some characters really unlikable and just translating comedy on from paper to me versus like on screen is difficult I think Shel uh, Serpent and Dove was a great way for Shelby Mahurin to show off that she had those skills to do that with characters. Um, and this book, just because of the plot, didn't have that. The main characters are together. Like, the, this is how this book ends and everything continues on in the next book. It wouldn't make sense for that to kind of exist. And they're literally in physically, ge geographically different places for some of this. So that's why. I understand why. But I also understand why, like, it wouldn't make sense for it to be in here. Um, so I think some of my love of this book was, like, some of the comedic tone and, and a little bit of the comic relief, which was just missing in Blood and Honey. Again, doesn't mean it's a bad book. Just meant The Serpent and Dove was a bit more to my tastes. So I think in the end I gave Serpent and Blood a 5 out of 5 stars and Blood and Honey a 4 out of 5 stars. Then I did a reread of The Deathless Girls by Kieran Millwood Hargrave. This was one of the group reads for the TBR and Beyond group. I remember reading this the book the first time being like what genre is this? And I know I came away we were talking uh in the in the group chat about it a little bit afterwards that it does kind of take a twist at a certain point like it it it, it, instead of like a book where like you read it and you're like okay I can see all these different genres pulled in but this one it felt more like different scenes were different genres if you know what I mean like it was kind of cut up that way I liked that I hadn't thought of it until someone mentioned it but she was saying I have not read a book with like Romani representation in it before and I was like wow actually I don't think I have either that's that's a big hole I've never and even too when I do hear things they always use terms like gypsy and that sort of stuff which is problematic it's a whole thing that's up in the air I've read all over the place but I just haven't read a ton where people have um I, you know there's some that have like no, uh, like nomadic or m moving tribes um or communities but never something quite like this so I loved that element that I hadn't thought of um before I also didn't realize it that it's like a retelling or like an expansion on the brides of Dracula or something like that and I haven't read Dracula before so how this book ends is very abrupt and I didn't totally love the ending. I felt like that's its biggest weakness. But someone who has read Dracula said that it actually does fit in with Dracula a fair bit with how it ends. So I think in 2021, I'm going to try and pick up Dracula and then give this a reread and see how I feel about it. I'll be very curious to kind of connect those those dots. So this one, I think it's, it's like at a four, 3.75, four and five stars. I really enjoyed it and I blew through it. It's just, yeah. Then I read The Southern Book Club's Guide to Vampire Slaying um, by Garth... I can't 
can't remember the author's name. It's on the tip of my tongue. What the heck? I'm sorry, I borrowed it from the library. Uh, this is a another very wonky book. Um, I it's a good book though. I know the author has um some people love and some people don't love his work. He has a very specific style. Not even just like writing style, but like the books he writes and that sort of stuff is very specific to to him. Um. I wanted to bash my head through a wall for most of this book because of the misogyny. It is a product of the time period, though. It would make no sense for any of the the, the husbands to say things other than what they said at the time. I am so happy I did not grow up in that time. Um, but the just the rampant sexism is really... Um, it is not hidden, we'll, we'll put it that way. Um, but I think it's a really wild book it's it's so weird i've not read anything remotely like it before the small town in the united states and it does bring up a couple issues of classism in that town between the poor and wealthy but also as the white and the black community um and someone moves into town and t people start like mysteriously going missing and it brings up two of when children of color or wealthy children go missing versus what the opposite is of when a white kid goes missing or when a poor kid goes missing. like it's there's a lot of contrasting there that it's not it's not like for like completely analyzed but it's very clear of like look at how they're treating the kids from the poor black community versus the white rich community there's an issue here um and then this book club guide of these women who have wildly sexist husbands kind of trying to balance between figuring out what's going on their morals um the structure of the family household at the time and role of women it's very interesting it's an it's a fascinating read do i ever want to read it again absolutely not because i would scream so it was a four out of five stars then i picked up shine by jessica young um i am so excited this at new york times bestsellers list i know they were i was seeing on on some of the um, K-pop Twitter accounts that I follow that translate the Korean news into English that they were like kind of debating or like her publisher in Korea was talking about delaying releasing it because of SM Entertainment who is the former company that she left under not great circumstances and like it was just it's a mess um, and so that they were I guess concerned that she was going to be writing stuff in there that is not like flattering to the company's image or something along those lines but um I, 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 I enjoyed this. It was cute. It was, yeah, I, I didn't have any issues with this. I think it's a book that though, like, I don't know that it'll f appeal to anyone who is not already within the K-pop realm, um, or doesn't know of Girls' Generation. I feel like that's a part of the big appeal of that is because she has that kind of inside. And there's very clear similarities, you know, there's co companies in, in K-pop for some reason are big fans of just being named like three letters. It's like YG Entertainment, JYP Entertainment, SM Entertainment. Um, so I mean, it pulls from a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, and one of the groups I looked at, I was like, that sounds, seems kind of like Big, big Bang, but, um, <laughs> I could be totally wrong, but um, I just think it's really interesting and I, I love that we're getting this kind of in influences in books now because K-pop is so popular. Um, it, now it's coming into the West and it's starting being incorporated. And I think it's great because I think Koreans and Korean Americans are going to see themselves uh, reflected in that a whole lot more. So that one got four, four out of five stars. Then I read The Stepsister Scheme. This was a very... Eh book um i don't know i was so hyped for it it was just like a pitch ever is like charlie's angels meets shrek and like i can definitely see the elements of both charlie's angels and shrek in it but it just didn't love up to everything i was hoping that it would for some reason which i'm sad because shrek is like one of my favorite like movies of all time um so i it just something was missing there there were so many elements of books um and movies that i love and for some reason it just didn't hit. I don't quite know how to explain it. Um, I liked the characters for the most part. The plot was kind of interesting. I liked that it was like very female centered, but there was just something, I don't know if wrong's the right word. There's just something that didn't fit for me for some reason. And it threw off like the whole book for me. So at the end it's like a three out of five stars. Then I picked up Trouble the Saints, and I'm so sad I didn't love this book. I had such high hopes for it. I think the time period that it's written in is fascinating, and the topics that it, it covers are really interesting, and I think it did a pretty good job of talking about race, and especially for the time period, because we forget how recent all of this crap was. But for some reason, when I just like looking at it as just a book, something about it didn't 
it didn't translate to me. Um, I don't know. I, I don't quite know how to explain it. I'm sad. I wanted to just adore this book so I could be like, ah, oh, I'll justify the like higher price tag and go buy it. And for a minute I thought like, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's the author's debut work. And then I looked and it's like, no, it's not. And the author's won a few awards. And I was like, oh, I'm annoyed that, and that I didn't like it. And like, <laughs> I was hoping that the low Goodreads review was just like, you know, personal taste or like, I shouldn't be hoping for this, but like people low ranking it just because it's an author of color because people do that. But no, I just didn't, I didn't love it. And I'm quite sad about that. So, so it's like a three out of five stars. Then I picked up Chasing Starlight by Terry Bailey Black. I, this is the arc of it. It showed up a little bit after I was supposed to have written a review for it. So I couldn't get that up on time. But um, the this is the author of The Girl at the Grave, which was just a mind blowingly good book that I think came out in 2019. Um, and so this is not a sequel, but the author's kind of follow up to that. It's set in old Hollywood and there is a murder and the main character um, has a complicated backstory and her aunt gets remarried to this dude who doesn't want her around. And so she is shipped to her grandfather who is kind of a washed up actor. And he's a little bit, um, not even just like, quirky there's things wrong he has like he's got some I don't know that I would say PTSD maybe but he's got some serious issues he's struggling with that are tied to her complicated upbringing um and so but she is very smart oh god this girl is so intelligent she wants to keep finishing school everyone's being like no just go get married like you can find a find a husband she's like no I want to go to university I want to go to college I want to go into sciences I'm interested in space I want to go into all these things um and then there's this murder and she kind of gets involved in trying to figure out what happened. And then she kind of interacts with the wards that are at her grandfather's house because her grandfather's financially struggling. So he has wards um, and they're trying to get into the film industry as well. And then there's the next door neighbor. And like, there's just this whole, it's almost like a giant game of Clue set in old Hollywood. Um, it's so well written. Terry Bailey Black has this amazing ability to give information that you're like, oh, this is world building. Oh, this is character building. And then you get to the end, you're like, bitch, she was giving me a hint and I didn't even think. <laughs> so I, oh, I'm, I, I wish this had a better cover to be totally honest, because I don't think this is a great cover for the book, but it's such a good read. It's so good. And I had, I had an inkling, a tiny inkling of who it might be just because I couldn't figure out what their other purpose in this would be. Like they could have existed in just a background role, but they didn't. They had actual scenes and dialogue and everything, but I did not know the full, like I, I had no guessing on like the entire um, reasoning for why they did what they did. So it was, even though it made sense once it was explained, I was like, oh, all this information was given. I'm just stupid. Um, so highly recommend you give this a read if you're a fan of fantasies um i'm not normally a fan of the old hollywood kind of setting i have a plethora of issues with hollywood um but that did not deter my love of this book at all absolutely loved it five out of five stars then i did a reread of the library of the unwritten and then a read of the new release the archive of the forgotten i think they're supposed to be one more book i'm not totally sure and i will like scream hallelujah if it's called the museum of something so we got the library archives and museums because that's like the, the triage there um i i i was i didn't know totally where book two was going to go honestly because of how book one ends with the positions that are kind of up in the air i wasn't totally sure what was going to happen but i was so excited because we were doing the archive um it's so good it's so good i think this is a series that I will fall back on when I just want to read a series that I know is solid, that's not like, that I just know what I'm getting, you know what I mean? Um, and it's a weird world and I like having these characters that were written by characters in this book who come to life and then play role. It's very interesting and fascinating and jumping between all these realms and then the politics of it. Um, it reminds me a little bit kind of of Scythe just a tad, uh, just a smidgen. It's not like parallels or anything like that. Just for something about this series reminds me of Scythe by Niall Schusterman, which is another series that I just absolutely adore. So uh, five out of five stars for both of them. After like 12 months, um, I decided to finally pick up the bone chart, <laughs> finish the like last two thirds of it. I, it. I had no issues with this book. I didn't dislike it. It was fine pacing. For some reason I put it down in like December and just like didn't get to it again. It's just been sitting on my cart. And I finally was like, 
screw it, pick it up and read it. I love this book. I love this book so much. I am, I want to read the sequel. And then I looked and the sequel has been released, but only in paperback. Why? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you publish book one in a hardcover, then paperback, and then push, publish book two only in paperback? Why? What was the logic, the justification behind that bullshit? I'm so upset about that. So I don't know what the hell to do. I don't know. The main character splits her potential life um, in an accident in this at the start um, on two paths and it goes down each chapter alternates between her path as one versus the other but it's this gift that she has and you're normally sent away to like a village or whatever to help that village with your gift um, and then it splits. Um, so it's it's a good book. I love this book. I'm so annoyed with the cover though. But the, the cover of book two is great, but why would you not release it? So I'm now, now like, do I buy this book in paperback and then buy book two in paperback? But then what do I do with this? Then I read The Shadows by Alex North, way out of my comfort zone wheelhouse uh, of books that I would normally read. Um, it's, I, it would, it, I, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of horror, but it was definitely a scary book for me uh, to read. Um, so I, I started reading it at night, I think. And then I was like, oh, wow, this is too scary. <laughs> so I had to read it during the day when it was light outside. Um, I, I'm assuming that's what the author was going for. It's a fun, it's a good book, though. I really enjoyed it. It's weird and wonky and like totally didn't know what to expect because it's not a genre uh, 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 or even like a subgenre of that genre that I normally go down. But it was really interesting and it just sounded familiar to something. So I don't know if there's like a like a folklore tale that I've maybe heard or a movie that that misuses that plot or something like that. But it was a good book. I enjoyed it. It's definitely four out of five stars. Then I picked up The Time of Green Magic. This book was so freaking cute. So stinking cute. It's not a book that I think I'll ever reread. And I don't think I'll ever go out and buy it. But um, having read it now through the library, it's so sweet. It's so cute. I love the concept of like a magical house and just this family that's kind of not broken, but it never was whole. It's a splintered family to begin with. Um, and just finding some sort of whatever in the house and the children kind of solving their issues with, you know, uh, parents and that sort of stuff. It was just really sweet. And then the animal in it was so cool and cute too. And I loved it. It was really cute. That was another four out of five stars. Then I read The Language of Ghosts by Heather Fawcett. I think I am going to buy this book. I'm not totally like a hundred percent sure yet, but I really loved this book. Of the middle grades this month, I think it was the best middle grade that I read. I love Heather Fawcett's writing, it just seems. Um, but this book is interesting because I was, as I was reading the book, my brain kept going, are they the villains? Like, is this just the villain side of, of a story and them j having the justifications and convincing me that they're the good guys the way that like bad people do? And I'm still not totally 100% sure <laughs> after having read it. Um, it's so interesting though, that that fact that like I got maybe halfway through and then I started reevaluating everything I had read. And then I was evaluating everything from that point onwards of, are they manipulating me? And I don't know if that's what a middle grade book was trying to do to me, but it did it to me. <laughs> I finally read The Bone Garden. Freaking finally, I've had an arc of this and it came out like two years ago. Um, this was, uh, this was a pleasant surprise, actually. Um, I think I still like the language of ghosts more, but I think this would be kind of the second favorite of the month. Um, it's so interesting, like the concept of someone making kids from bones and like all, uh, just this whole concept was really interesting. It was definitely a lot of strong core line vibes. So I think especially as a child, I would have eaten the hell up out of this. Like this is a really good, I think Coraline was a bit more horror leaning than this, but this still has a lot of those similar elements. It doesn't sew your eyes with buttons, which honest to God, that scarred the shit out of me as a child because I still have nightmares about that. And I read that book when I was like eight. Um, but this is a weird book, but really interesting. Then I picked up The Dark Tide by Alicia Jasinska. Um, I think the overall rating on Goodreads is a tad bit low, but I think in the end I give it like a three and a half out of five stars. I don't think that it was necessarily anything unique to the realm. Um, and it wasn't everything I was hoping it would be, but I think for a debut work, it wasn't terrible by any means. Um, I enjoyed it for the most part. Didn't 
I didn't, I don't know that I had anything giant issue wise with it. It's just, it is what it is. It's not author offering anything new, I think, to the YA realm with magic or anything like that, but it's an interesting read. I liked it. Then I picked up Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is one of my most anticipated reads of the year, so I was going with very high hopes, and it did not disappoint by any means. Also, the cover is like reflective y. It's so good. It's such a good book. It's the, the sailing and the adventuring and the pirating and the main characters and like everything about it is so good and it's like on top of that of it being just a good book it's got representation in it and Rebecca Roanhorse is an indigenous author if you only take read one book of this whole month that I'm talking about let it be Black Sun it's so good then I really quickly read through Ring Shout this was uh, like I <laughs> this is an author I've read one other um novella from this author so I was very curious about it this is, I feel like I'm just saying weird a lot, but this is a very weird book, but I honestly wish it had been made into a full-blown novel instead of just a novella. Um, so the main character, the, the author takes the clan and makes them like actual monsters. So it's like a dystopian historical fiction. Um, and the main characters are predominantly all black. It's, it's so weird, but it's so fascinating. Like this entire, the, I don't think that many authors, even that are black could do what he did with the concept because it is such a dark, messed up, like the whole concept, the existence of the Ku Klux Klan is just fucked up, period. Um, so then messing with it, as I just think that's something that's really difficult to do. Um, but this was an amazing read. It was so interesting, so fascinating. I would read a full blown novel with this, um, with these characters and the conflict and it just expanded. Then I read All These Monsters by Amy Tintera. Um, I have read her Ruined series, which is my favorite of hers. And I've also read her rebooted uh, duology. And I think this one fits in the middle between those two for, in terms of my liking of them. Um, it's an interesting concept that there's essentially like monsters that keep appearing. It almost feels like, like a video game where there's like underground tunnels and monsters live underground and then they just start popping up and like killing people. Um, so then all these people, these teens essentially get recruited to go fight them. And some of the cities are more overrun than others. Um, and so our main character is from a really domestically abused household and decides to, this is her way out. Um, and so, and then very quickly she gets involved in a romantic relationship with someone who's a little bit older than her. Um, and, I will add a trigger warning here because I, I don't think I'm not sure if it's exactly I just feel like I'd I'd rather have it than not have it but there's a trigger warning for domestic abuse within this not even just the household but the relationship she has with that boy it is not glossed over though I will I was concerned about that when it started appearing and I went oh god like is this going to be just deemed like a normal like boy obsessed he's in love and passion it's not um but I think that's just something that if you are someone who was in a domestic abusively in a relationship that was domestically abusive um this is something just maybe go in aware being be go in being aware that this is going to be in there um i don't think again it's anything new to the ya realm i think it sticks with amy tintera's strengths um and i liked the crew the whole crew element um that kind of form around her while they're all fighting um is great so in the end it's like a three seven five three point seven five four to five stars then I picked up Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. Um, I actually thought this after I read the book. And then I saw, I think he tweeted, quote tweeted someone, um, that their parents were having issues with using their preferred pronouns after they'd transitioned. And they gave this, the parents or whatever this book, and they have since updated that. And I read this, th I'm reading this, and I went, this would probably be a really good book um, if you are someone who has transitioned, um, who's still in contact with your family, but they're struggling with it. Whether it's conflict of culture or whatever it may be, you're still talking with each other. You're not there cutting each other out of your lives, um, but you want acceptance from them. This would probably be a good book to kind of broach the subject with them with. Um, it's really fun, like plot wise though, uh, of the, the main characters trying to solve a problem essentially in order to prove their worth because they want to take part in ceremonies that are traditionally for men but the family still sees pre-transition version so female and they um they're also struggling with the fact that they lost their mother so there's a few different elements at play and it's just a really good read it was 
an impressive debut work. I have to also say that I got to the end and kind of forgot that. Um, and then sat down a little while later and went, wow, this is the author's first book. That's impressive. This is so clearly written. The characters are well developed. Everything about this is great. And I can't wait, wait to read whatever else he comes out with. Then I read The Initial Insult by Mindy McGinnis. This is an arc. Um, it comes out in 2021. It is, it is traditional what the fuckery Mindy McGinnis. It's... <laughs> the cover makes a whole lot more sense now having read it. But essentially, there are two main characters. One grew up in a very unideal situation with uh, an abusive uncle and aunt as her guardians after her parents have died. Her parents died very mysteriously and everyone in town stopped looking almost immediately and it was mentioned a few times to her so she has an inkling that it's because someone in town that has money was involved. Her best friend is the daughter of someone in town that has money um, and they over their childhood you know, their friendship kind of splinters um, and breaks and kind of dissipates. The one, one character is literally bricking someone up. Um, and each row of the bricks is explaining a story of what's led to this. I don't know what's going to happen in a sequel to it with how it ends. I don't quite know how, because it's supposed to be a duology, but I will definitely read the sequel. It's a weird book, though. I will say that. And I don't know that it'll be something that everyone will enjoy just because of how it's structured, nor the fact that someone is being bricked up alive. Fair enough that I I can understand that. Um, so it's an interesting read. It's very Mindy McGinnis. Very, very Mindy mcginnis -y. So it's like a four out of five stars. Then I read The Cavendish, the Cavendish Home for Boys and Girls by Claire Legrand. You're welcome, Melanie. I finally read it. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it's an, interesting book I will will give it that this is another one that has a lot of Coraline vibes I I'm surprised how many books I've read now as an adult that I'm like I would have loved this as a kid because I loved Coraline so much um but I feel like a lot of these books just didn't exist when Coraline was when I was young and I was reading Coraline um so the main character Victoria is like the straight eight like awesome girl in hometown and then kids start going missing um or are like sent away by their parents and everyone starts acting weird and then she ends up going to the Cavendish home which is where she finds all the kids that have gone missing who are being trained I guess to be like good kids um and one of them is her best friend so she wants to get down to to the bottom of it it's an interesting book and I don't totally know what to do with the ending. Um, but it's it's a fun read for sure. I think at the end it's like a five, four or five out of five stars. It's a fun read for sure. Then I read The Forgotten Kingdom by Sing Pike. This is a rare ex uh, instant, instance, I think, of I think I liked the sequel more than the first book. The Lost Queen, The Lost Queen, that sounds right. Um, the Lost Queen sets everything up, all the conflict, all the characters, all of everything. And this book just like kind of plows on with that. Now that that's all been created, it, it just expands on it with more character POVs um, and less about like the affair drama and everything of the first book. Um, I love this book so much. I blew through it and did not realize how quickly I, like it felt like I had like, oh, just sat down and read it even though I think I split it up between like three days between like reading other books or whatever. It felt like I read through so fast. It did not drag whatsoever. There was so much happening, so much like moving around and character switching and everything. It was all just so interesting and I loved it. Everything that was set up in The Lost Queen, it felt like had a purpose when I read this book. Um, so absolutely love five out of five stars. I also read Instant Karma. Um, that was an arc I got through NetGalley. Um, I read it, I thought it was okay, it was fine. Um, um, but I saw people that were upset that it's using this concept of karma because that is specifically in its origin tied to Hinduism, um, and elements of Indian culture. That wasn't something that I ever thought of because the concept of what goes around comes around and karma is not new to the West. It's everywhere I've ever lived and heard and it's a part of conversation and dialogue and slang and just everything so that was a weird thing that I hadn't thought of and I don't know what to do with that so I don't know that I can really give this book a rating with that information and then I finished October how I wanted to I did a reread of Grimoire Noir the graphic novel um the illustrations of this book are just 
insane and I'm just trying to make it a tradition to read it every Halloween. Um, and then wrapping up, least to most favorite whatever, uh, my least favorite would probably be the stepsister scheme. Most surprising book this week, month, sorry, of October, um, I think would be The Language of Ghosts because I'm still thinking about that book and I don't know if we, if the main character is evil or not. And favorites of the month, um, I've been reading a lot more adult content, which I'm glad that I'm enjoying it. Um, it would be a, honestly a toss up between The Forgotten Kingdom by Sing Pike and Black Sun, but, but just because I was honestly so excited for Black Sun and it was just like, I could have been let down so easily. I'm gonna say Black Sun if I had to pick between these two was my complete absolute favorite this month. So yeah, that was my October. Let me know if you read any of these, what your thoughts were, what did you read in October? Um, and if you have any questions, I'm going to do another like, I don't know, ask me questions kind of video probably next Tuesday now that I think I'm caught up. I'll have to look at my schedule, but yeah. And I am getting ready for December because I'm going on holidays again in December. Yay! So um, I'll get lots of reading done then. So yeah, stay safe, wear a mask, um, Black Lives Matter, um, especially if you're in the United States. Until power transitions be careful and avoid going to counter protests um i think donald trump is just waiting to try and enact martial law and any reason you give him is a reason he will take um so yeah have a wonderful day stay safe and i will see y'all later